Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C. based Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our Get Far Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR, or Federal Acquisition Regulations, is the rulebook that the federal government must follow when making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We will post all of the recordings on our website and YouTube channel, where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. A special thanks to our, our webinar partner in this series, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would also like to thank our friends at Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jennifershouse.com. And now a little bit about us. We work pri with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And now we would, we would like to let you know about some ways to reach government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series for pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jennifershouse.com. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speaker, Eric Crucius. You can find his contact information here. And today we are covering FAR Part 37 with Eric. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are thankful for your participation in this series. The floor is now yours. Great, thanks for having me. And you could go to the next slide. Um, FAR Part 37, uh, services, contracting for services. Um, I'm especially grateful that you're tuning in to learn about contracting for services on the Friday before Labor Day. Um, but uh, this is actually a pretty important topic and one of the most important parts of the FAR. Um, as you could probably guess from the title and the title of the part, um, the scope of FAR Part 37 applies to all contracts and orders for services, as it says here. Um, it also includes uh, all contracts that are covered by the Service Contract Labor Standards, which was formerly known as the Service Contract Act. I thought, um, based on how much content is in FAR Part 37, um, it, we have a little bit of time to talk about uh, Service Contract Labor Standards, SCA, because most contractors who have FAR Part 37 uh, services contracts, at least at some point, will touch the Service Contract Act, as I like to still call it, um, how it used to be called. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so a few things about what they are. Um, simply stated, the uh, service contract labor standards requires uh, workers to be paid in accordance with a set, um, at least at a minimum, wages and benefits according to a wage determination that's attached to a contract. Um, that's the very simple explanation of what it is. The implementation in theory, so the implementation in reality is actually quite a bit more difficult. Um, so the wages uh, would be in, a, in an attached wage determination, as I said, and we'll go through what those are really quick, and this is just a very high overview. Um, the wage terminations also require um, benefits. There's three types of benefits that SCA uh, contractors should uh, be concerned with and, and, to, and provide to employees. The first is an hourly H&W, health and welfare figure. That H&W can be paid in the form of cash. It can be paid in the form of, or provided in the form of benefits but it must be provided to uh, employees. Um, there's also a vacation requirement. Um, it's uh, generally, not every wage termination is the same, but it's generally two weeks after the first year. Um, and then after five years, it increases to three weeks. And uh, after I believe 15 years, it's either 10 or 15, it increases usually to, to four weeks at that point. Um, the vacation does not best until the first the employee's first anniversary. So in the first year that the employee is working on the contract for, for the contractor, they're not entitled to any vacation time. I would caution though with respect to vacation to be careful because if the employee previously worked on the contract or um, previously worked for the company but in a non-SCA role, their anniversary date that's tied to when the vacation vest may be different than the start of the contract. So you want to look at that very carefully. Then there's a holidays requirement. Um, the holidays are listed in the wage termination and uh, contractor employees uh, who are covered by the SCA must get those uh, holidays off or an alternative holiday or get paid. Uh, additionally, if, if the holidays are not being given, if there are alternative holidays or they don't take them, um, the contractor must notify the employee in, in advance of that, ideally when they're hired. I always use the example, uh, for instance, that if you have a contract to provide Santa Clauses, right, to a military base, 
Um, obviously, December 25th is a very busy day for Santa, so perhaps you want your Santa Clauses working on December 25th, but that's a holiday in the uh, WD wage determination. So you you consult with the Santa Clauses ahead of time and say, hey, you know, why don't you take off December 26th instead? Uh, and that's permissible to kind of come up with an agreement like that. Um, another requirement is employee notification. You notify the employees when they're hired that they're SCA employees. You provide their um, wage and their labor category and things like that. And then uh, record retention. Um, there's a certain scope of records that you might be um, um, uh, keep for three years. Generally speaking, the records that you have to keep for three years under the SCA are records you'd already keep anyway for other reasons. So um, uh, usually folks don't get caught up too much in that. But um, records can also include like time cards and things like that. So that's usually where if people get caught up in the record retention issue, that's where they get caught up. It's important though, on the just to go back for one second, to think about the employee notification. Oftentimes, uh, it really gets the uh, folks at, at DOL, their ears perk up when they're, when employees have not been notified properly and there's no poster uh, on the SCA in the workplace to the extent there is a physical workplace or electronic poster in an electronic workplace because they feel like the company will have other issues if they can't comply with the basic notification requirement. So it really um, causes uh, oftentimes a further investigation if, if that if that hasn't been done properly. So you want to pay careful attention to that. It's not like a contractor is going to get debarred for not uh, notifying employees. I don't think I've ever seen a case in that instance, although nothing is ever impossible. But it really kind of is a portends to uh, a more aggressive investigation sometimes. Let's go to the next slide. So I want to just talk for a minute about wage determinations here. Um, uh, you know, so what I said in the last last slide is that um, folks have to be paid in accordance with the wage determination, um, and the, what. We know what a typical standard wage termination looks like if you haven't seen it before if you have a passing knowledge of it is that there are labor categories listed on the wage termination there's a dollar figure next to the labor category and that's the minimum that an employee uh, or worker i should say should get paid um, for their on an hourly basis and i say worker because um we, um, you know, it doesn't matter if somebody's categorized as a 1099 or a full-time employee or a part-time or full-time or whatever, they still get the benefits associated with the Service Contract Act. If they're not full-time, they just get a prorated share. So if you have a worker who's working 20 hours a week instead of 40, they get half the benefits essentially that a 40 hour a week employee would get. And of course, there's a lot of complications associated with that, but that's the very high level uh, view of it. So, you know, because the wage determinations are so important to this process, I think it's good to kind of go over them. So there's four types of wage determinations um, you should think about. One is a standard wage determination, and that's kind of the default wage determination you'll see attached to most contract solicitations. Those are the ones that the GSA schedule program will flow all the way down. Um, and I want to note that um, ordinarily it's not up to the contractor to choose which standard wage, wage determination is required. Um, that's up to the agency in the first instance to to uh, select and attach to a solicitation in an ideal world. Of course, uh, if you work in government contracts, you know that the world is often not ideal. So um, you know th that doesn't always happen. So there are you know there are methods to kind of try to get that correct wage termination in there. But um, let's let's talk about an ideal world world for a second. Um, you can see here, uh, there's two types of standard wage, wage terminations that I, we, we call odd and even wage terminations. And they're called odd and even because the number, the wage termination number is always odd or even. So we have to think back to kind of second grade math, right? And uh, see if the number the itself that is the identifier for the wage termination is odd or even. Um, if it's odd, um, then the, the, the odd ones I should say are by far the most common of them. Um, although there are some evens around. Um, if it's odd though, the employees must be paid a set H&W amount on a per hour basis for every hour paid, not work paid, up to 40 hours a week. And that means that um, um, it's not doesn't have to be cash, it could be in the form of benefits um, or some, there, some combination. It's usually a little cheaper to do it in the form of uh, benefits because you don't have to pay FICA and things like that because the uh, tax authorities will assume that even if the benefits, even if the cash is being paid for benefits, it's still considered income and salary and stuff. So you're going to get dinged on that. 
And then you have the even wage terminations and they're a little different. Um, first of all, it's for every hour worked, not paid, and there's no limit. So if you have a worker who's working 80 hours a week, that's 80 hours of benefits. But also another difference is that it doesn't have to be um, um, assigned to every employee based on how many hours they work. It could be into a pool. So if you have a contract with 100 folks on it and you decide you wanna just pay the full-time workers benefits, um, you could do that as long as you account for all the hours those full-time workers to be getting the benefits earned by the part-time workers. Um, and there's some nuance in there, but that's from a very high level. That's what it, wage terminations are really just um, ones that are following new work and new have an even wage termination that they should only have odd ones. So those are the standard wage determinations. Um, and uh, if you haven't looked at one before, I, I um, think that uh, it's interesting um, Labor Day weekend reading, <laughs> if you're interested. Um, the second kind is, is CBA wage termination. So it, it, sometimes um, the work that's being done on a service contract, that contract is covered by a um, CBA, a union contract. And um, let's just say the contractors entered into a CBA with the, um, um, with the workers, that CBA will supplant the um, wage determinations. Uh, that are issued by Department of Labor. Um, but you must provide the CBA to the agency within a certain time period or else the CBA will not be adopted by the agency. And if it's not adopted by the agency, you still may be obligated to pay the CBA wages and benefits, but you may not get compensated from the government for paying those wages and benefits, which sometimes are richer than the WD, standard WD uh, wages and benefits. So a caution in that. If a previous contractor had a CBA um, and you don't, you're still obligated to pay the wages and benefits, not the same kind of benefits necessarily, but the same amount um, that the workers were previously paid under a CBA. Um, then there's contract and industry specific uh, wage determinations. And these are ones that are just issued for either um, particular industries such as fast food restaurants to reflect the economic realities of those industries or contract specific ones um, that are, you know, there perhaps is a nationwide contract um, and it's just one WD for the entire nation. Um, but those are done on a contract by contract basis. So that's kind of an overview of that. Um, next slide. So just briefly, some um, high level pitfalls of uh, compliance with the service contract labor standards. And again, um, there is a reference to, to the SCLS uh, in uh, FAR Part 37. And I think it's important to cover because uh, a lot of contracts that are in this FAR section um, are service contract labor standards, or as I like to still call it, SCA, Service Contract Act contracts. And I see a ton of mistakes being made with these contracts. Um, so uh, something new to good pay attention to. The first is the prime sub-issues. Um, we can go, I can talk for the whole half hour to hour on prime sub-issues and Service Contract Act contracts, but I won't do that to you. Um, I think too much of you all <laughs> to do that. But for prime sub-issues, um, a few things to note, if you're a prime contractor, you're jointly and severally liable for your subcontractors um, service contract act violations. So that's in the regulations. So um, be careful about the subcontractors you pick because you could be left holding the bag. Um, I sh you know, also the prime is responsible for flowing down the clause and waste determinations to the subcontractors and, and trying to do their best to ensure compliance without going ahead and auditing them, of course. Um, but you want to make sure that they understand the subcontractor understands um, their obligations and that they're you know get them to certify maybe in your subcontract agreement that they're complying with the service contract act and that they'll let you know if they fall out of compliance with the service contract act because again um, if the subcontractor kind of flakes out and doesn't pay and then goes out of business or doesn't provide um, uh, the appropriate wages and benefits, the prime contractor could be responsible for those. Um, DOL could hold the prime responsible. If the prime has done everything correctly, such as flow down the clauses and, and all that good stuff, and the sub doesn't comply, DOL will typically go to the sub first and get them try to get the money out of them. But if the prime has not done those things, then sometimes the DOL will go straight to the prime for not properly flowing things down. So just be very careful about that um, along the way. With respect to the subcontractors, if you're a subcontractor and you have a contract with a prime government contractor and there's no SCA clause and wage termination in there and you think that it sounds like an SCA um, contract, 
um, then having a dialogue with the prime contractor about that, I think is really important. It's really good in the front end to address these issues and address these potential problems before they become really big problems and issues, um, ideally before performance starts, but even now is better than 10 days from now, right? So um, those are just some high level prime sub issues that you may come across when dealing with the Service Contract Act. The second thing is um, GSA schedule program. I said before, um, just a few minutes ago, that it's really up to the um, it's really up to the agency to identify its determination and put it in a solicitation. The GSA schedule program is is actually what GSA does is they include all the ways to terminate errors in the GSA contract and they attach them to the schedule contract and mass mod them along the way and uh, as new ones come in when an order is issued off it's actually up to the contractor to choose um, which GSA schedule is appropriate and this prevents some problems first of all um, you know how do you know which one to choose I mean sometimes it's obvious based on the um, location and things like that but it's not always so obvious and another issue is you have you know you've bid as a contractor you bid a certain amount for a certain out of the uh, um, certain area of the country and uh, that certain amount for a certain area of the country in your GSA schedule may not support higher priced areas of the country where you haven't done work before. Um, so for instance, let's say you, you, you primarily do work in the Kansas City metro area, so your rates on your GSA schedule reflect that and let's say you're, you're trying to get an opportunity for San Francisco, well the San Francisco wage termination is going to be far richer than the Kansas City metro ones, but maybe you're, you're bound within your um, GSA schedule contract to only bid a certain amount. So you can't exceed your GSA schedule prices, but you also have to pay a minimum amount that's required in the wage termination, which could be higher than your GSA schedule prices. And GSA's position has been that you need to lose the money first and then get the mod to your contract to allow for those higher rates. So some complicating factors there with GSA schedules on, on SEA. Um, Another uh, pitfall that we see commonly is accounting for hours worked. This is a tricky area um, uh, in, in labor and employment and in particular for government contracts about what counts for hours worked. You have issues with travel, whether that counts for hours worked. What about if you're being paid to wait or waiting to be paid? Um, or I should say um, being paid to uh, be on call or not. Um, those are, you know, those kinds of different issues that come up as far as what accounts for hours work make, makes it a little bit more difficult. And if you, if that's not accounted for properly, that's not just an SC, uh, FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act violation, that's also a Service Contract Act violation. So that gets you two ways coming. Um, I should note that the, um, you know, the SCA is enforced solely by the Department of Labor. Um, folks can't sue in federal court over the SCA like they can with the Fair Labor Standards Act, but what you don't what you sometimes see is you have a, because if you don't account for hours work properly, it's an FLSA and SCA violation simultaneously. You may have somebody filing a suit in federal court under the FLSA, and you may have an investigation under the SCA by the Department of Labor, which is not a fun uh, day when both are happening at the same time. Another um, pitfall is a, a vacation accrual, and I kind of mentioned it a little bit before, but um, it's, um, you know, it's, the way the vacation is accrued in the, under the Service Contract Act is, is quite a bit different um, than how we typically accrue vacation these days. Um, typically, um, most folks here who work for a contractor or even for the federal government, you accrue a certain amount of vacation time for every hour or day you work. So over time, you build up, you know, three, two to four weeks is what's most typical over the course of a year. So perhaps every quarter you build up a little less than a week. Um, and uh, you could do the math. It's you know like one one hour for every um, 15, 20 hours worked or something like that. Um, so that's not what the SCA does, though. You you accrue nothing uh, under the SCA uh, for every day or hour you work. It's on day 366 of your work there is when you get your two weeks. Day 364 you get nothing. Or I should say day six, 365 you get the two weeks. It's after a year. So um, the entitlement to vacation. Um, is zero until you pass that year threshold uh, on the job. And that year threshold is keyed off of the anniversary date of the worker. And the anniversary date is when the worker started working on that project, uh, you know, doing that work for you. 
Now, if the worker had previously worked at the same federal facility doing similar work or had previously worked for the contractor in a different capacity, non-SCA capacity, their, um, their anniversary date will be pegged to when they started doing that work uh, for the company or doing any work for the company or started doing that work for a different contractor. So you want to be very careful about that vacation accrual and seeing when um, it actually begins. Um, the final uh, kind of pitfall is not taking an SCA investigation seriously. While it's true that not a ton of contractors are debarred because they uh, don't follow the Service Contract Act, there are some every year. And um, it's important to kind of take those investigations seriously. So if, if there is an inquiry from the Department of Labor, you want to have folks in the room who understand the problem and or potential problem and who treat the investigator well. You may disagree with the what the investigator is doing. You may not like what the investigator is doing, but having a good working relationship with the investigator is extremely important. They have a lot of power in their hands, and they can recommend a debarment proceeding after the investigation concludes. And if you do get word that there's an investigation, or you're um, you know you're told that by DOL there is one, and they want to talk to the company, I would um, do kind of an internal, a quick internal look. I wouldn't say investigation, but review to see if you could figure out what the problem is. Um, so um, try to understand um, the next, the genesis of the of what the investigation is. Oftentimes, companies are aware that there is an issue um, that they've been trying to solve, and um, you know if it's a hundred dollar problem versus a hundred thousand dollar problem, that may um, create a different response, and and uh, whether you know outside counsel or outside consultants are used to help through the problem. Let's go to the next slide. So, um, so one one uh, thing to note: it's not just the service contract labor standards. There are some what I call adjacent requirements, um, and there's two that are left. One was um, non-displacement of qualified workers was uh, struck down by the Trump administration on Halloween of 2019. Um, so there's two left to, to be. To think about one is the minimum wage for contractors so every year there's a new minimum wage um, that contractors have to pay all employees if the clause is in their contract uh, regardless of what the wage determination says and this includes employees who are working directly on the contract or in connection with the contract so let me be clear about something with the SCA it only concerns the wages and benefits and all those requirements only concern those who are essentially performing the requirements of the contract Adjacent folks who are supporting the contract but in the back office role are not covered, generally speaking, by the SCA. These two things here, minimum wage and paid sick leave, are the exception to that rule. So minimum wage um, impacts those folks who are working in connection with the contract, such as an accountant maybe sending out bills for the contract, if they work on these SCA contracts a certain percentage of their time. For paid sick leave, um, same deal, but it also paid sick leave also includes exempt employees. So SCA wage, you know, the SCA wages and benefits are only required for non-exempt employees. Uh, the minimum wage for contractors are generally only from non-exempt employees. Um, but paid sick leave is for non-exempt, exempt, and folks who are working in connection with the contract, not just direct bill to the contract. And the paid sick leave requirement is for one hour of paid sick leave for every 30 hours uh, worked. And um, that that paid sick leave requirement um, would be written into a contract, and it also would require a lower H&W rate uh, in the wage determination. If you look at a, a more recent wage determination, you'll see that there's a split in the H&W required, depending on whether paid sick leave is in the contract or not. The implementation of paid sick leave can be kind of complicated, and especially now that we have paid sick leave uh, required locally and uh, across the country, and say um, like in a DC in DC itself, uh, California in Massachusetts, other jurisdictions, and that sometimes those paid sick leave provisions are a little different than the paid sick leave um, that you see um, in this paid sick leave law um, requirement that's in your contract. So you have to try to balance those requirements um, as well. Let's go to the next slide. So there are other things, of course, besides the service contract labor standards and part, part, part 37. So we're gonna go through some of those now with our remaining time. Um, so what is a service contract? That, that's a pretty basic part. Um, uh, FAR 37.101 has a bunch of definitions, um, and uh, I just uh, um, thought this was probably the most interesting one and probably the one most foundational to this part because it identifies what a con service contract is and what's covered by this 
uh, by this uh, FARB section. So it's really broad definition as to perform, as you can see here, an identifiable task rather than furnish an end, end item of supply. So you can see that's very broad. You're you're providing your task oriented and not supply oriented. Obviously, sometimes contracts have a mix, and there may be some contracts that have supplies and tasks. There may be some contracts that have construction and supplies. You know, you could get any kind of combination. Sometimes that means that the contract is segregable, and you can have requirements uh, connected to both. And sometimes, you know, the the services aspect or the construction aspect or the supply aspect is kind of de minimis compared to the other aspects of it and uh, it's just ancillary. Um, so here's some examples of some service contracts taken right from the from the FAR clause. You see maintenance overhaul or repair of equipment, that's very common. Advisory services, we're seeing you know, um, communication services and R&D. These are all very common categories of services that are provided to the federal government, but pretty much you could think of a thousand categories of services that would come under this uh, FAR section. Let's go to the next slide. So um, one other definition I uh, of note because it carries through the section is uh, the idea of performance-based contracting. Um, so this is this is actually important and foundational to kind of how service contracts operate these days. And the idea behind performance-based contracting is that the government's not going to tell you how to do your job in theory. Um, obviously, there are sometimes they're just ordering bodies, right? Um, but they want to accomplish a goal and they'll leave it up to the contractor to figure out how they're going to accomplish that goal. That's the ideal. Instead, because the government, you know, the idea is that the contractor knows how best to accomplish these things, not the um, not the folks in the agency. So they, they, you know, they tell the agency they want X done and it's up to the contractor how to figure out how to get X done. The, you know, it shouldn't be, we want X done and this is the, you know, decision tree and how you're going to go through it and the different tasks you're going to do on a granular level. Um, so the idea of um, performance-based contracting is um, is kind of the idea that, that you're you're attaining a goal, you're providing a service to the government, and the government's not going to tell you how to do it. You're going to figure out the best way to do it. Um, so it's really um, um, to have um, you know it's important to have a specific statement of work or performance work statement that kind of details what a contractor is supposed to accomplish, but you know how to accomplish that goal. I mean, some contracts are better than others at this, but how to accomplish that goal is left to the contractor. Let's go to the next slide. So, um, you know, as it says here, the policy 37.102 is that performance-based contracts are preferred, um, unless you're talking about architect and engineer services, construction, utility, or incidental services. So, um, and those present their own kind of specific uh, issues, and that's why um, performance-based acquisition isn't necessarily the, the preferred method there. So the um, this policy talks about an order of precedence about what the government prefers to do. Um, the ideal for them is a firm fixed-price performance-based contract. We're going to give you $1,000 to uh, mow the lawn, right? You can figure out which mower you want to use, uh, but if it's electric or gas or hand-powered, hand um, back in the day when I was um, a lot younger, I lived in Brooklyn and we had a hand uh, uh, hand mower that was uh, very difficult to use actually. It had a lot of, uh, it looks easy on TV, I will just tell you that, a lot easier than it actually is because the grass gets caught all in it and uh, makes it very hard to push. You have to clean it out quite often. Um, but they're going to they're gonna tell you what they want done, they're not going to tell you how to do it and you're going to be paid a set price to do it. The risk is on the contractor there, right? Let's just say... Um, you say you could mow the lawn for a thousand dollars for a weekly mow for the course of a year, and let's say that you figure out a really less expensive way to do that, then you can get the benefit of those profits if, for, you know, for some reason you figure out a less expensive way to do that. Um, but on the other hand, if um, your mower breaks and you need to buy a new mower and you lose money on the whole thing, um, the risk is still on the contractor. There are exceptions to that, of course, you know, where there's um, a material change to the contract, maybe. The government said just mow the front lawn of this building and not the back lawn and all of a sudden they change it to the back lawn well the contractor then has a right to come in and, and alter that price even in a firm fixed price situation because there's a change to the contract there um, but firm fixed price performance-based contracts are the uh, preference then we go to non-firm fixed price performance-based contracts um, so you know you think of your cost type uh, contracts um, 
uh, that's the most obvious example of that. And then you have the non-performance-based contracts, whether firm fixed price or not, as the third in the order of precedence. So you can get an idea of what the, what the uh, government prefers uh, along the way. Let's go to the next slide. So, um, uh, far, so I should note here um, that we're not touching on every provision in FAR Part 37. It would take um, way more than the time we have allotted. And there are just some parts of FAR Part 37 that are just not, um, there. every part is important, I should say that. Every provision is important, but some are more universally important than others. So some may be important to less than 1% of the folks who tune in. Uh, we're not gonna cover those or some that are just kind of, um, you know, not, um, won't change things uh, significantly for folks who are viewing. I may not cover those, but there are some that, um, so we're not we're not covering every provision. We're covering the the provisions of note, I should say. So one of those provisions of note is this 37.104 personal services contracts. Um, generally speaking, unless there's an exception, per personal services contracts are not permitted. Um, and uh, you, as you can see, actually on the bottom of the slide, uh, I forgot I put that in there. That they have, must be specifically authorized by statute. And to understand whether it's a personal services contract, you kind of look to the employer-employee relationship, uh, what terms are in the contract, how it's administered, and the government supervision of the personnel. Um, you know, and, and they really identify it as kind of where the contract, uh, where the government is supervising the, the contractor employees and not the contractor. Or maybe it's just one single person who essentially getting paid by, you know, by the government to do work. You know, that's an end run around uh, the government's hiring practices where they're supposed to hire the employees through a certain system. So they don't like to see that. Um, so it's up to the contractor to supervise the employees. Now, sometimes, you know, we hear from the field that the government thinks that the contractor employees are their own employees. And um, you can kind of note this provision to them and, and explain why it's important um, that uh, they don't supervise um, the contractor employees. So let's go to the next slide. So this 37.107 is the service contract labor standards. Um, I will say, um, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing again about SCA, um, but I wanted to use this part to kind of note a couple of things. One, um, the service contract labor standards is not automatically applicable. It's not applicable to every service contract. It's only applicable to the ones where the agency has put the clause and wage termination into the contract, and that includes GSA schedules, um, unless it's specifically disclaimed. Um, now, the agency could get it wrong sometimes. They may forget to put a wage termination in or, or those kinds of things. So as a contractor, if you think it's an SCA contract and the agency hasn't done that, you may want to, you know, it's a good to ping them and say, hey, is this an SCA contract? Uh, if so, can you include the clause and or wage determination in there? Um, because what will happen is if the agency determines it's not and DOL comes in and does an investigation and determines that it is, the contractor has to pay those back wages and benefits that weren't paid previously. Now, there's a price adjustment clause in, in there uh, where the contractor can get it back, but there's a time that the contractor is going to have to float that difference. And, you know, you, you don't want to be in a position where you're asking the uh, government for agency for money that they may not have, although you may be entitled to it as a contractor. So um, it's not automatically applicable. Um, it must be, the work must be primarily for services utilizing service employees. Service employees are non-exempt employees who are providing services. Um, it has to be performed in the U.S. So the portions of the contract not performed in the U.S. will not be covered by the Service Contract Act. Um, there are some limited exceptions, such as uh, remanufacturing of products, servicing um, products that are um, have been previously supplied by the contractor, things like that. These are pretty limited exceptions, though, so I would not um, rest on any of them unless you could really figure it out that you're entitled to that exception. Uh, and sometimes, with certain exceptions, you have to um, get the agency to kind of sign off on them. So, um, but the agency does make the initial applicability decision. And I'll say too, it's just because you have a service contract, that contract doesn't mean that everyone on the contract is covered by the SCA. Of course, there are exempt employees on that contract too who would not be covered by the SCA, uh, any part of it except for the adjacent uh, sick leave requirement. Let's go to the next slide. So we have 3710.10 um, uh, Small Business Certificate of Competency. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with what a certificate of competency is, um, it's um, 
let's just say you have a contract, you're a contractor that doesn't have a lot of um, past performance. You bid on a contract and you're given a neutral because you don't have past performance. Um, at that point in time, maybe you have the best bid and the agency wants to award the contract to you. Um, the agency is then required to go to the Small Business Administration and get what's called a Certificate of Competency. The Certificate of Competency from the Small Business Administration would be that they've reviewed certain things and submissions from the contractor and they believe the contractor has the wherewithal um, to perform this contract. Um, sometimes the agencies kind of misuse what a Certificate of Competency is to try to get um, certain things done that they want to accomplish, but that's at the core, that's what the certificate, certificate of competency is for. And it requires essentially the whole, the whole system requires a, uh, a contractor, a small business contractor who has not, um, does not have, really have any past performance to get that neutral rating. So they're not excluded from the competition. Of course, that increases the risk to the government. So then the government uses, uses this certificate of competency kind of um, system to allow SBA to sign off and lower the risk and assess the risk to the government and essentially determine whether the risk is unacceptable or not. If it's acceptable, the business is, is issued a certificate of competency and the contract is then awarded to that business. Um, here, this provision talks about when, um, when a certificate of competency is maybe not sufficient. Perhaps there is a, um, a contract that requires, quote, the highest competence attainable. In those circumstances, a certificate of competency would not necessarily cut it, and uh, the uh, agency could award potentially the contract to somebody else. And that's what this provision is about. Let's go to the next slide. Extension of services. Sometimes contract awards are delayed. Sometimes, I'll be honest, it's my fault for filing a protest for somebody, and that delays the award of a contract. Um, uh, sometimes it's not the bid protest lawyer's fault. <laughs> Uh, things sometimes happen, but this allows for the extension of services for no more than six months. It could be extended you know, two month increments or three month increments or one six month in increments. And it requires that the um, pay, the compensation to the contractor be the same as it was before over that six month period, unless there is a, an adjustment to the wage determination. So it allows for an extension at the same rate. Again, unless there's an adjustment and there's a new wage determination and, and in that instance, the contractor can get the difference caused by the new wage determination. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so FAR, FAR Part 37.2 uh, concerns advisory and assistance services, um, and agencies are permitted to do contract for those services when it's essential to the mission, um, but there are limits to when what an agency can do with um, uh, advisory and assistance services, and I, I have a pretty good list here. Uh, one, it can't be for policy or decision making on the agency. Um, you know, on the agency's part, it's up to the agency to make their pol own policy and decision making uh, uh, opinions. Um, it can bypass employment procedures. So, if, let's just say the agency wants to hire five people, it's too laborious. So, what they do is they'll just hire these folks as advisory services folks uh, from a contractor and avoid having to go through the rigmarole of hiring the folks to the federal government. Um, that's not a permit, permitted use of advisory and assistance services. Um, it can't be done to kind of influence or enhance legislation. Um, and if the services are available, readily available within the agency or another federal agency, um, the folks who are seeking these advisory and assistance services are supposed to use that other readily available resource within the federal government and not go and go to a contractor and, and contract it out. Let's go to the next slide. So, um, this section, this subpart of uh, FAR Part 37 talks about the dismantling, demolition, and removal of mines. Um, and other real property and removal of such structures. Um, they make a note to say that it's covered by the Service Contract Labor Standards or the Davis-Bacon Act, which is known in here as the wage rate requirements. And that's highly dependent on the nature of the work. I will say the intersection of Davis-Bacon and Service Contract Act are, is often very complicated because what constitutes a service or what constitutes construction is Davis-Bacon Act is kind of the equivalent of Service Contract Act, but for construction, there are some important differences such as the waste determinations and the fact that Davis-Bacon Act requires a certified payroll. Um, the bar for debarment is higher in Davis-Bacon Act. You have to really um, screw up, uh, whereas the Service Contract Act doesn't require kind of a negative mens rea 
it just requires that it happens. We call that in a legal area a strict liability. If you violate it, you're out. Um, in reality, though, um, DOL doesn't doesn't debar every contractor that violates the Service Contract Act. There'd be no more contractors if that happened. Um, but Davis-Bacon Act that requires a higher bar for debarment. So there's some differences. But the labor standards that are used for this part are either SCA or Davis-Bacon Act. Um, and the, how you apply each one of them can be kind of a, it's very factually intensive and it can be pretty complicated. And some contracts have both. If there are two separate um, parts of the contract that can be divisible and attributable to each of the acts. Let's go to the next slide. So um, some other parts of this 37.3, 37.302, um, um, bonds are ordinarily not required, but a contracting officer may require a bond in their own discretion. And it talks about that a little bit more in detail in 37.302. And 37.304 um, specifies the contract clauses that should be inserted uh, based, uh, based upon the circumstances um, uh, that they find in the contract. So if you do this kind of work, I'd recommend looking at these FAR clauses and making sure that they don't pose an issue. Let's go to the next slide. Um, of course, um, we have healthcare is, is, is a big, um, big service, uh, important service that's being provided these days and it has been for some time. Um, if you're if you're a contractor and providing healthcare service, non-personal healthcare services to the federal government, 37402 talks about the requirement that you uh, must obtain insurance and present evidence of that insurance to the federal government. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and this this uh, 37.6 talks a little bit more about performance-based acquisition and what that means. Um, so a couple of important points. 36 37.601 talks about the fact that the solicitation should have a performance work statement or a statement of objectives. Um, and um, it's this is important because they need a method to kind of you know the contractor is given in theory a lot of discretion and they need a method to kind of match up what the contractor is doing on the contract to ensure that there's a way to kind of measure the performance. Are they accomplishing their goals? So, um, you know, this, the second bullet point kind of talks to that. You have to have a performance work, work standard, um, performance uh, work statement. You must have some measurable standards and a method of assessing that performance and, and even provide performance incentives where that's appropriate. You know, you get this done early, maybe there's an incentive of some kind for that, or if you get done late, you get paid less. Um, that, that's a possibility. But the first two are, the, are ubiquitous um, performance work statement and some kind of standards and a method of assessing performance. For instance, you're going to you're going to finish 50% of the task within 30 days, right? That's a measurable performance standard. They're not telling you how to do it. They're just saying it, half of it has to be done within 30 days. And uh, maybe there's a report that's required weekly to kind of assess, help us help the government assess performance. So that covers kind of the first two parts of that bullet point. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so the, this is a kind of a little bit more granular on what should be in a performance work statement. So you should be seeing these in the performance work statements. First of all, results are um, that it's not a step-by-step -step guide about how, you know, what is our goal. And it um, to measure uh, to to uh, to under whether the goals were accomplished or not. You know, how 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 do we measure success? So the government's got to figure out how to measure success, and then put that in the PWS, and uh, which will allow the contractor give the contractor notice about how the government's going to assess um, um, whether the goals were accomplished or not. Assess success essentially. Um, so uh, very important to do that. Otherwise, you know, if when those things are unclear, I've seen it so many times that there becomes a food fight about whether the contractor did what they were supposed to do or not. Um, and it can get kind of ugly, and there's oftentimes not a clear way out because the PWS and how you measure success is just not entirely clear. Let's go to the next slide. And that um, is the uh, end of this presentation on FAR Part 37. With that, I'll turn it over, back over to the folks uh, hosting. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, Eric. And to our audience members, we thank you again for participating with us. If you have questions about this part, please contact our speaker with the contact information you see on the screen. And if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.